Good afternoon from New York City and welcome. My name is Gabriela Chacon, assistant of the America's Dialogue on Education Policy Initiative at the Institute of Latin American Studies, or ILAS, at Columbia University. On behalf of ILAS, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth of a series of book and paper presentations and discussions that we have held this academic year. The book that we will be presented today is Rural Education, Social Experiments, and the State in Mexico, 1910 to 1933. The original title of the book is in Spanish, Educación Rural, Experimentos Sociales y Estado en México, 1910 a 1933. We will begin with the presentation of the book by author Marco Calderón, followed by a discussion with Professor Carlos Escalante. We will then have a Q&A session where you will be able to raise your hand to ask questions. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be uploaded to ELAS YouTube and may be shared through its different communication channels. Now, let me introduce you to Professor Marco Calderón and Professor Carlos Escalante. Marco Calderón Molgora is a professor and researcher at the Center for Anthropological Studies at El Colegio de Michoacán. He specializes in political anthropology and has published articles on regional political processes and cardenismo in the 20th century. His current research focuses on the story of rural education, cultural change, and the building of the Mexican state in the 20s and 30s. Funded by Mexican Secretary of Public Education, his latest book, Educación Rural, Experimentos Sociales y Estado en México, 1910 a 1933, was published by El Colegio de Michoacán in 2018 and explored those topics. For his part, Carlos Escalante is a researcher and coordinator of the academic seminar on contemporary history at El Colegio Mexiquense. His lines of research in recent years have been history of literacy and written culture, history of education in the 19th and 20th centuries, and history of indigenous education. He's part of the National System of Researchers, level two. His most recent book is entitled in Spanish, Mazawas, Peasants and Teachers the practice of writing, land, and schools in the history of Yocotitlan, Mexico State. Sorry, the original title is in Spanish. He has edited several <laughs> monographs, including Living Among Schools, Stories and Presence, and National Adult Literacy Experience, Latin America in the 20th century. He has also authored several book chapters and articles, among which Revisiting the Casa del Estudiante Indígena, Mexico and literacy premiers in times of war, Spain and Mexico. So now, after all this presentation, let me please introduce you first to Professor Marco Caldero. Well, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. For me, it's a great pleasure. I am a little nervous because my English is not so good. So I'm going to read my presentation. I hope you understand my English, very Mexican English. So I really appreciate uh, the, all the help Domina uh, uh, and Gabby. And well, let me start to read this text. Uh, this book is the result of many years of work, more than two decades ago, while analyzing some political studies linked to the control of the municipal government of Cheran, Michoacan, and their relationship with different meanings about Cardenism through time, I became interested in the conflicts arising from cultural change related to the growing interference of the federal government in indigenous areas through rural schools. One aspect that captures my attention was the book 
by Moisés Sainz about the experimental station in Carapa, Michoacán. It took me a while to realize that this case was only one of the several social experiments promoted by the sector. One social experiment very important was the Casa del Estudiante Indígena, a boarding school uh, in Mexico City. The notion of social experiment caught my, my interest in a very powerful way. How to understand the concept? What did such experiment consist of? How were they put into practice? What were the results? I went to the SEPS archives and soon found several documents that refer to different social experiments. My obsession with the subject led me to various archival collections, accumulating a large amount of data. Given the enormous bibliography on rural education in Mexico, another vital question was, how could I say something new on this topic? What argument would allow me to connect all this amazing information? Inspired by the book edited by Gilbert Joseph and Daniel Nugent, the revolution and the negotiation of rule in modern Mexico, I understood that some of my answers were related to cultural change and state formation through time. Taking some social experiments organized by SEP in 1920s and 1930s, the central objective of my book is to analyze the, the way in which SEP's rural education program contribute to the cultural change associated with the post-revolutionary state formation in Mexico. Drawing upon extensive data collection, my research reconstructs a complex history of social experiments whose purpose was to find effective methods to incorporate or assimilate or integrate the indigenous population into the Mexican nation. The structure of the book. The book includes a general introduction, eight chapters, a final conclusion. The fifth section consists of two chapters that describe the central background of SEP's rural education program. Chapter one discuss the indigenous problem and the way in which education proposed to solve it. The second chapter reconstructs some elements of Manuel Gamio's experience in the Teotihuacan Valley, a social experiment that would have to be taken up by SEP shortly after. The second part is made up of six chapters linked to different social experiments organized by SEP. Chapter three describes the main characteristics of the rural education project, some elements of the history of the missionary teachers, and some aspects of rural schools or casas del pueblo. It also addresses the change in the federal policy during the Plutarco Elias Calles presidential administration and the Maximato, that is to say, the period in which Calles, the president Calles or ex president Calles, become a strong man of Mexico. Chapter four analyzed the history of itinerant cultural mission or group of teachers who went from village to village, giving classes to rural teachers, doing social work, and carrying, uh, carrying out some research. It emphasized the leading role of Elena Torres Cuellar, who studied a master's degree in rural education in Teachers College 
under the direction of Michael Kelly. Chapter five illustrates how SEF's itinerant cultural missions were implemented in the state of Michoacán, as well as how they were received and adapted to local circumstances. Chapters six and seven analyze the case of two permanent cultural missions, one in Xocoyuca and Tlaxcala, and the other one in Actopan, Hidalgo. In both cases, the role of the social worker was central. Elena Landazuri and Katarina Vesta Sturz, respectively, who were also women. Chapter seven is an extensive anal analysis of the Carapan Experimental Station in Michoacán. The argument. Several circumstances influ influence SEPs to establish different strategies in order to find adequate methods to civilize and to educate. Different regional realities, diverse ways to interpret and appropriate the projects, the creation of unions and their corporatization to the new regime, the intervention of local thought. Given the deep customs, traditions, practices, and ways of production, ordinary people turn out to be difficult to transform. As the initial optimist vanished, set, set out several social experiments to find effective methods to civilize and educate. In, order, in other words, the constant search for different methods in the, is, a, is a result of the ex extensive problem, existing problems to implement the project promoted by the revolutionary elites. A central element of the history of rural education sought to industrialize the countryside, which implied radical change in the social organization work habits, habits and instruments and way of thinking and acting of the population. Taking into account the work of Philip Corrigan and Derek Sayer, it is possible to argue that the post-revolutionary elites were promoting, promoting new forms of moral regulation linked to new forms of market production. Many federal officials were, were interested in promoting the industrialization of agricultural, agricultural production. Although in public discourse, it was essential to take into account the needs of the rural population, local needs seems, seem to have been subordinate to the needs of the national Several traditional practices went against the demands of progress and modernization. Intellectuals and workers of SEP, land owners and businessmen, shared some ideas about the inhabitants of the countryside. According to this vision, indigenous people were apathetic and limited themselves to producing only enough to satisfy their daily needs, in addition to being isolated religious fanatics, having problems with alcohol, and living in hygienic conditions. An old 19th century Mexican liberal conviction persisted regarding the supposed degeneration of the indigenous people. What had seemingly changed was the explanation related to the causes of the social backward. A key element about the indigenous problem was in the forms of socialization promoted by traditional family and Catholic church, in addition to a long history of oppression and subordination. 
In other words, it was no longer a problem of race, but of social organization. However, given the difficulties in promoting change of habits, the initial optimism was questioned. In this context, theological explanation regarding social backwardness soon began to take popularity up again. That was the case of Carlos Vasauri, an ethnologist who worked for several years in SEC. Some of his writings referred to the social backwardness of the Ottoman population, alluding to endocrinological problems and inappropriate sexual behavior. Something that seems to have been a constant was the firm belief that scientific knowledge was essential to find efficient methods to educate. It was for this reason that different social experiments were carried out with the aim to finding effective methods to create productive citizens, teach literacy, promote the industrialization of the countryside, create new expectations, force a modernized nation, and build a new state. A basic aspect of the public discourse had to do with knowing the needs of the rural population, as well as their expectations. To do that, it was essential to carry out social research using scientific theories and methods, borrowing from anthropology, sociology, and psychology, among other sides. In this regard, a significant event was in 1910, Indian Congress, organized by the Mexican Indian Society in the context of the celebration of the first 100th anniversary of the Mexican independence. Based on empirical data, several members of the Indianist social society presented papers about the educability of indigenous people. Some of the members of the society have been reflecting on the matter in previous years. Some of them proposed creating schools for indigenous in towns. Others suggest sending itinerant teachers. There were those who thought that the most effective strategy was to educate indigenous in the city so that they could later return to the localities as a social leaders and promoters of economic and cultural change. What about the time? Uh, the population yeah. of no worries, Marco. Keep going. You have still um, eight minutes, so it's fine. Great. In my opinion, a very important antecedent of the Mexican rural school was a project organized by Manuel Gamio on the population of the Teotihuacan Valley in 1970. The, the idea was to carry out scientific, scientific research in order to find adequate methods to promote the normal development of the indigenous population. Sociologists, anthropologists, ethnologists, ethnologists and archaeologists and historians took part in this experiment. A central aspect of the project was the constitution of the regional school in which some local infants would be able to begin their primary studies. In 1920, Jose Vasconcelos started a literacy program through honorary teachers. A year later, when the SEP was established, the literacy program adopted new modalities. The missionary teachers were given the task to create school 
train people to room them and collect data from available natural resources and local social trusts. Such information would be useful in order to design an effective educational strategy. It soon became clear that this strategy was not leaving the expected results. In 1922, an important course of missionary teachers was held in the Mexico City. At this juncture, Gamio emphasized the need to train traveling professors to carry out social research. The missionary teachers had to prepare detailed reports on the local context in which the school were created, which would help both to the training of the teachers and the transformation of the communities. Carrying out this task was indeed very complex and quickly revealed, revealed that the research work carried out by those teachers was insufficient to achieve the ambition goals of SEP. 1923, no, yes, 1923 was a significant year in relation to rural education and social experiment. In, this, in the first place, Professor Enrique Corona promote the creation of Las Casas del Pueblo, House of the People, that is rural schools based on the postulates of the School of Action. Those new house, houses were new socialization space in which new men and new women would be educated. That same year marked the beginning of the itinerant cultural mission. Thank you very, very much. Give it to me. Group, 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 group groups made up of several twice. teachers who offer, somebody has. Uh, I'm picking you up, so I take it. I'm sorry. That, that same year, 1923, marked the beginning of the itinerant cultural missions. That is, work groups made up of several teachers who offered training courses to local rural teachers. The missionaries also organized workshops in carpentry, agriculture, beekeeping, blacksmith, and tanning. These missions were at the same time working social institute in the sense that the members of the teams had to carry out research to propose solutions to a specific problems. The group of cultural missionaries settled down in a strategic place just for three weeks and then moved to, an, to other areas. The missionaries prepared detailed reports on the activities that they carry out, as well as an, on natural resources, local industries, customs, tradition, disease, health problems, and weather, among other elements. 1928 marks another stage in the history of social experiments. That year, several criticisms were made against the work carried out by the itinerant cultural mission. Since then, since then the itinera itinerant mission remained in the communities for a whole month. In addition, permanent cultural missions were created. Two significant, significant experiences in this regard were those of Choco Yucan, Tlaxcala, and Atopan Hidalgo. However, new criticism arose regarding the result of the permanent mission. Under that context, the Indian Research Commission was created in 1931 with the goal of carrying out another social experiment. Such was the case of the Carapan Experimental Station. The cultural mission disappeared during the government of Cárdenas. However, some social research institutes were created in the decade of 1930 
as was the case of Peneche in Hidalgo, in which Manuel Gamio played a relevant role. Several indigenous sporting schools were also created in the same period. Institutions now known as a social experiment. In such process, Carlos Brasauri played a key role. In my current investigation, I am working on it. Why read this book? <laughs> In my opinion, there are some contributions of this book. Although there are several texts about La Casa del Estudiante Indígena in Mexico City, like Carlos uh, Escalante, this is the first book that analyzes the history of various social experiments carried out in rural areas. Second, it accounts for cru crucial stage of the indigenous several years before the construction of National Indigenous Institute, Instituto Nacional Indigenista. Another relevant aspect referred to the way in which said projects were received and in local spheres. And finally, for me, the most re 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 relevant, relevant, relevant contribution referred to the participation of prominent feminists in the construction of the Mexican rural school, like Elena Torres Cuellar, Elena Landazuri, and uh, Catarina uh, Sturz, and uh, among others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marco, for this explaining for this explanatory uh, and detailed contribution. Now, please let me give the word to uh, Carlos so we can discuss about the book. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just having some trouble to move my screen. I'm gonna stop sharing maybe in that way I'll be able to see everyone. Yeah, okay. No, I'm fine. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Marco. We have heard not only your enthusiasm, but also your struggle with English. And maybe I'm just thinking about how uh, some also colonialism or trying to uh, the colonial practices are so into us that we are trying to find some other languages to be heard in other spheres in the world. So we're part of that. Uh, thank you so much. And now, uh, please, Carlos, we hear you. Um, yeah, we can hear you now, Carlos. Yeah, thank you very much. I have to say to everyone, uh, I'm sorry because my I don't speak English well, so I'm I'm gonna speak in my own language. Eh, creo que empiezo agradeciendo a mi colega y amigo Marco Calderón por la invitación a presentar su libro en este importante foro en el marco de una institución norteamericana que acerca los hallazgos de investigaciones sobre México a un público amplio y especializado como el que hoy nos escucha. La historiografía de la educación mexicana ha documentado desde diferentes perspectivas, a veces nacionales, otras veces locales, unas de manera general, otras como estudios de caso, unas centradas en instituciones, otras en concepciones, por ejemplo, pero ha logrado documentar la experiencia histórica de la escuela rural en México ha mostrado las propuestas, los logros y los fracasos. Ha resaltado personajes que le dieron sustento pedagógico y ha mostrado a diferentes actores del medio rural. Ha profundizado en el estudio de algunas instituciones y finalmente ha relacionado la propuesta con la edificación de un sistema educativo moderno y nacional paralelo a la construcción de la nación. El libro de Marco Calderón, que nos ha hecho una síntesis muy, 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 muy eficaz, constituye un riguroso estudio de las diversas formas 
en que desde los gobiernos federales se intentó llevar la escuela a las localidades rurales del país con objeto de conseguir la integración nacional. Tales formas fueron agrupadas bajo el término general de experimentos sociales, que el autor de este libro recupera la expresión de la época y lo relaciona con la construcción del Estado postrevolucionario y de la nación misma y nos proporciona una mirada de conjunto. Una de sus preocupaciones está en dilucidar los mecanismos o procesos que la Escuela Rural Federal tuvo para lograr cambios culturales en los diferentes contextos del campo mexicano. En palabras del autor, el objetivo central del libro es analizar la forma en que el programa de educación rural del gobierno federal contribuyó al cambio cultural asociado a la formación del estado de la posrevolución, a la difusión del sentimiento de ser mexicano y a la constitución de un nuevo régimen político. Eh, ya en su contribución al libro que coordinó con Elizabeth Buenabad, Educación Indígena, Ciudadanía y Estado en México, siglo XX, Marco Calderón adelantaba algunas de las pre premisas que vertebran esta reciente obra. En su intervención, él comentó que eh, le llevó muchos años hacer este libro. Consulta de muchos repositorios, de muchos referentes, un diálogo importante con historiadores mexicanistas en Estados Unidos, pero también historiadores mexicanos. Menciono esto como uno de los rasgos del proceder que caracterizan el trabajo de investigación de Calderón. Una meditada y paciente labor de reunir piezas documentales y testimoniales para ir dando respuesta a sus interrogantes sobre el pasado, rasgo que es indudable, que es indudable, constituye una virtud y que nuestros sistemas eficientistas de evaluación de investigadores pone en serio peligro de extinción. Nos hacen producir muy rápido y muchas cosas y no nos permiten esta mirada detenida que tenemos que tener. Ha tenido ya su, su, su premio esta paciente labor. El libro ha sido ya publicado en, con varias reseñas, tanto en publicaciones eh, en la Ciudad de México, en Guadalajara, como también en Argentina. Quizás por eso es que veo y saludo a mi colega de Argentina, Pablo Pinó, que nos está escuchando. Eh, finalizo con algunas de las rasgos que me parecen importantes, sin ánimo de ser exhaustivo, pero algunos de los aportes que también dan mi respuesta a la pregunta que hizo Marco de por qué leer el libro. Una primera tiene que ver con el ensayo de periodización que propone Marco Calderón. Nos permite mostrar algunos de los cambios culturales y de las permanencias que ocurrieron en estos años convulsos, los cuales son tomados como un bloque temporal, dejando de lado la comodidad de analizar periodos gubernamentales, lo que suele ser usual en nuestra historiografía educativa. En, vi en virtud de esta propuesta de periodización, es posible conectar los antecedentes, entre comillas, previos a la labor de la Secretaría de Educación Pública y establecer no solo las diferencias, pero también las continuidades en la mirada de las élites sobre el llamado problema indígena y sobre su posible solución. Especialmente interesante me pareció la conexión que Marco Calderón hace de la sociedad indianista mexicana y su congreso con las discusiones y debates sostenidos a partir, a partir de la formulación de los experimentos sociales que estudia el autor. Una segunda aportación es que introduce una nueva mirada histórica a la Escuela Rural Federal bajo el rubro de experimentos sociales, estos laboratorios culturales que tan detalladamente explica en su libro Marco Calderón. Hasta ahora habían sido vistos de manera fragmentada y no se había reparado en el término mismo, el cual, como demuestra Calderón, constituye uno de los elementos centrales del núcleo de iniciativas emprendidas por la SEP a partir de la década de 1920. Tercero, y esto ya también lo mencionó Marco, 
propone una historia del indigenismo mexicano que no nace con el Instituto Nacional Indigenista a finales de los años 40, sino que se gesta en el periodo de estudio del libro. Introduce matices significativos en torno a los debates sobre la educabilidad del indígena y sobre la mirada que había sobre este. Un cuarto aporte es el destacar la relevancia de mujeres educadoras que derribaron barreras burocráticas y que se toparon también con estas. Elena Torres Cuellar, Elena Landazuri, Catalina Vesta Esturges, Eulalia Guzmán, Evangelina Rodríguez, por mencionar las más citadas en el libro. Al mismo tiempo, visibiliza la importante labor de las trabajadoras sociales y economas domésticas, cuyo silencioso trabajo permitió el despliegue del trabajo educativo en las misiones culturales, las eh, rotativas, pero también las permanentes, en los internados y en otras instituciones de estos experimentos sociales. La quinta, me parece importante destacarla en este foro, abre una nueva dimensión a las posibilidades de estudio de la circulación de ideas educativas a partir de flujos recíprocos como el de México con Estados Unidos. Además que el autor dialoga con los me mexicanistas que han estudiado la educación mexicana en los años de 1920 y 1930, da a luz documentación de repositorios ubicados en Estados Unidos y amplía una nueva mirada sobre la vinculación entre ambos países en materia educativa. En ese sentido, continúa con una tradición académica de la que David Raby, Mary Kay Bong, Stephen Lewis, Alexander Dawson y otros más han sido constructores en ese rico mirar el pasado educativo mexicano. Sexta, la combinación de una mirada historiográfica con una so so socioantropológica y el cuidado metodológico que ésta supone es otro de los rasgos de que destacaría del libro. Ayudará a que los jóvenes interesados en el periodo y en la historia de la educación cuenten con un ejemplo de la forma en que opera un investigador. Finalmente, y con esta finalizo, la consulta exhaustiva prácticamente de diversos repositorios. Quisiera contar aquí una anécdota. En alguna ocasión me encontraba yo en el archivo histórico de la Secretaría de Educación Pública y ahí estaba Marco Calderón eh, con sus aparatos, fotografía y cosas para, para eh, escanear eh, los documentos eh, asistiéndola una, una auxiliar de investigación. En el Archivo General de la Nación también consultó muchas cosas, algunas de las fotografías que nos ha presentado, en la Biblioteca Butler de la Universidad de Columbia, en la Biblioteca Latinoamericana de la Universidad de Tulane, en la Universidad de Chicago también, por supuesto en la Biblioteca Teachers College de esta Universidad de Columbia, y en la imprescindible Biblioteca Neri Lee Benson de la Universidad de Texas, así como en otros eh, repositorios y la consulta de publicaciones como el Boletín de la Sociedad Indianista Mexicana, el Boletín de la SED y revistas como Etnos, Quetzalcóatl, Mexican Folkways, entre otras. Esto da una idea, me parece, a, a, vinculada con lo que ha dicho Marco en su presentación, de la importancia del libro. Creo que va a ser un, eh, in, eh, una in, importante obra que va a permitirnos nuevas preguntas desde las preocupaciones que cada investigador tenemos y de volver a vincular lo local con lo nacional en esta construcción del Estado mexicano en la que la educación jugó un papel muy importante. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Carlos. We now open the space for the audience to ask their questions in the chat. While we wait for more questions, I will start with some of the questions that were raised at the start of the event, at the beginning of the event. And one of them has to be about the role of teachers. So I will ask Marco, In this case, how the teachers that were being trained in the community receive missionaries from abroad? Were they open to learning from them and applying their ways to teach 
the modern? Well, it was different in several places, but uh, one important uh, difference is between women and, and men. Uh, normally men were more resistant. And in the book, uh, some, in some page of the book, one could read uh, this kind of resistance uh, from men. And women were more <laughs> Uh, uh, how can I say, uh, interest. They were, they were very uh, serious in, in, his, in her attitude in front of the teachers. And yeah, it, it, it was, uh, I can see some difference in, according to the region as well. Because in some regions, it's the, the, the enthusiasm of, of the people was very uh, evident. And in other places, it, it was a, a problem. Because it, it, obviously, this, all this process is related to the conflict between uh, church, church, Catholic church, and, and federal government. And, to, and so, and then, in some places, como Paracho, Michoacán, uh, the people was very angry because uh, they don't want to rule the school. But in some places, uh, they were very enthusiastic. So this is a very good question, but it's hard to to give a, a only answer. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> no worry, Marco. Thank you. I, I got another question from Alma Garcia. I'm going to read it in Spanish. And I hope uh, Romina can help me with the translation in English. Um, Alma pregunta, eh, a partir de las dificultades y críticas que los distintos experimentos sociales para los pueblos indígenas o que los pueblos indígenas se enfrentaron, ¿tiene cabida en tu revisión, Marco, el papel de la agencia y la resistencia de los pueblos indígenas? Y si no, eh, ¿qué es lo que opinas al respecto? Creo que, eh, ah, y creo que también Carlos nos podría dar su opinión sobre esto. Este, sí, bueno, podría responder en español, supongo. Este, eh, sí, hay, hay pueblos y regiones en las que había, digamos, tradiciones muy largas, eh, indígenas, en cuanto a tierras comunales, costumbres y tradiciones, y en esas zonas, pues hubo una reacción más, más fuerte en contra de estos proyectos federales, porque, este, por ejemplo, en Cherán, que es uno de los casos que más conozco, este, pues ellos tenían tierras comunales y no, no querían eh, transformarse en ejidos, porque esto de la educación rural estaba muy tenía mucho que ver también con el reparto agrario del ejido. Y el ejido era una forma de, comun, de propiedad comunal que estaba proponiendo el gobierno federal, pero que era diferente a las formas de organización social de las comunidades indígenas que conservaban sus tierras comunales. Muchas comunidades indígenas habían desaparecido desde el siglo XIX y otras en el siglo XX, Primero por las reyes de reforma y después por el reparto agrario. Pero en aquellas comunidades donde todavía la propiedad comunal seguía jugando un papel muy relevante o seguía existiendo, este, pues mostraron más resistencia a este tipo de proyectos. Pero, pues otra vez, no, no, no es posible dar una 
respuesta como homogénea depende del caso, depende de la región, depende del estado. Y eh, digamos que a largo plazo la respuesta es que sí, el, el proyecto federal logró algunos objetivos y otros provocó también causas de procesos no esperados. ¿Y qué, qué sí logró? Bueno, yo creo que parte de, de este sentimiento nacionalista que después se constituyó en, pues en el llamado nacionalismo revolucionario, este, pues está ahí, ahí en ciernes, porque la escuela rural tenía un papel muy importante en la difusión del sentimiento nacional, los festivales cívicos, este, las actividades que se hacían alrededor de la escuela, no solo en la escuela, sino también alrededor de la escuela. Pero no sé si Carlos quisiera intervenir. Gracias, con gusto. Sí, yo creo que el libro nos permite visualizar parte de esta conflictiva de apropiación diferenciada, como dice él, de la escuela o de los experimentos sociales. Varios de estos experimentos realmente podríamos decir que fracasaron, pero otros a largo plazo, como ha dicho Marco, tuvieron una, una, eh, un éxito. ¿no? Él ya pone el ejemplo de la, de la, eh, de la identidad nacional, pero yo mencionaría también el de la apropiación de la escuela, es decir, la escuela finalmente en las comunidades rurales e indígenas se ganó su lugar a partir de todas estas iniciativas que se gestan en los años 20 y 30. Y una de las resistencias importantes, mencionaba Marco, tiene que ver con la reforma agraria, porque también en, el, en, el, en la propuesta de la SEP, las escuelas rurales federales tenían que tener una parcela que muchas veces su extensión era de dos o tres hectáreas en la propuesta de la SEP, mientras que cada ejidatario había conseguido media hectárea para su uso. Entonces, obviamente, era un lujo tener una parcela escolar en, 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 en estos contextos. Y por eso es que había esa resistencia, no quizás a la escuela misma, sino a esta idea de la parcela escolar, porque también se criticaba, a veces con razón, a los maestros o maestras de que utilizaban a los niños para sembrar y que eso pues no era educativo porque eso lo podían aprender con sus padres, ¿no? Creo que eso es lo que yo podría decir. Muchas gracias a ambos. Y tengo otra pregunta más. La voy a hacer en inglés porque ya ya me, me confundí también. Uh -huh. ah, y quizás yo misma la puedo traducir al, al español eh, y luego ya pasamos a, nuevamente a, a Romina eh, apoyándonos con, con este, este cambio lingüístico. So, um, what are the current reactions of, Mexican, of the Mexican government when terms such as social experiments are brought up? So, ¿Cuáles son las, las reacciones actuales que tiene el gobierno mexicano cuando se utilizan términos como experimentos sociales? El actual eh, gobierno mexicano. El actual gobierno mexicano, exactamente. Uf, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. But uh, something that for me very important is... Uh, Now, the, the actual government is, is talking about the new, the new education. Um, I, I think that in the 1930s and 1920s, there were several <laughs> innovations in, in that time that was considered, that they were considered news, a new, a new rural school, and now They are the some officials of the actual government are, are talking about the new rural schools and the new school in Mexico. But if we have this possibility to compare what was going on in 
talk series and what is going on now. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we can find several radical differences. And, and it, one, another problem is find this discourse about, about modernity and progress. Uh, obviously, behind this discourse, we can find problems with the um, post-colonial culture and something and this kind of uh, difficulties. And in even in the Cuatro T <laughs> government or the actual current government government of Lopez Obrador, some of these uh, concepts are uh, are present, and it, this is a little crazy because they are talking about the, a radical transformation and problems with the social inequality and uh, indigenous population and justice and, and several things and at the same time at, at the same time we can find contradictions and I, I, I I'm not sure what what could go what will be the future about this but I, I am worried. I, 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 I'm not sure if I'm uh, answering the question, but more or less is the, I, I can say now. Thanks, Marco. Oh, Carlos, do you want to add something? Pues compartir mi inseguridad en una respuesta más o menos contundente. Creo que la pregunta es muy importante porque trata de vincular ese pasado con el presente, que es un poco lo que nosotros tratamos de hacer, ir hacia el pasado desde las preocupaciones del presente. ¿no? Pero eh, desgraciadamente no podría yo intentar una respuesta más convincente. Creo que también estoy preocupado por los cambios, porque el sexenio ha avanzado y apenas están modificando los, los libros de texto y los programas, ¿no? Entonces se les ha acabado el tiempo en ese sentido, lo cual nos deja la lección histórica de que las eh, reformas o los cambios educativos tienen que pensarse más allá del sexenio, más allá de lo que es un sexenio gubernamental. Eh, como saben, en México no hay reelección, entonces pues tenemos que pensar en medidas que sean sí en el corto plazo, pero también en el mediano y en el largo plazo, algo que no es tan fácil de hacer, pero que puede ser el intento frente a que ya hemos hecho mucho de lo mismo y no ha funcionado del todo. Thank you, Carlos. And I think we share the same concern with other countries in Latin America about the long-term projects in education and in other aspects of the government. So um, I'm we have two more questions, only four minutes. So I will try my best to do it as, as fast as possible. So first, Marco, could you please talk us more about the pictures, the pictures that ah, yes. we were yeah, sharing while you were uh, talking, please? Can, can, I, can we see the pictures now? Uh, yeah, I can share them again. Please give me a minute. Yes, the, 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 those pictures come from uh, the uh, Actopan experience. I mean, the permanent, permanent cultural mission of Actopan. Indeed, the, 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 it was a more important cultural mission in, a, in was in Actopan because uh, the period 1928 and 1931 was the, the, uh, it was an experience of three years. And this is a, a school, may, uh, one of the pr um, proposals of the missionaries wa was to create the schools and this school is very important. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we, can, we can, I can say something 
about the details, but if you see the boy just to the left in, in the in uh, in the down in the part of uh, abajo, mm -hmm. <laughs> this boy is smiling, and this is a very important thing because one one part of the vision of these promoters of progress is what's related with the impossibility or incapacity of the indigenous people to love, to laugh. And it, it was obviously a, a prejudice, un prejuicio, no? Mm -hmm. But if, if we see the next uh, picture, you can see uh, this this beautiful girl smiling and she is this is the cover how can i say the cover of the book la portada and she's so she's also smiling and she's working with the ixtle mm -hmm. this is a very important local industry in re regional level and she's happy <laughs> unless or even though the social conditions mm -hmm. and can, can we see the next uh, the next picture ah, this is fantastic uh, uh, the doctor is in the middle of well to the left you can see a man with different sweet <laughs> and all those women are uh, assistants from the doctor and it this kind of assistant was a innovation of catalina vesta Sturz, the social worker who was working in this uh, cultural mission in obviously in one chapter of my book is related is all this information appears and uh, obviously the problem of the health was very important especially with the uh, boys and girls con el nacimiento the child born Birth. and mm -hmm. problems related to this and all those women were working uh, with the doctor and the social worker. The next, thank, please. Yeah, thank you so much, Marco. Um, okay. Maybe we will try. Can you just explain this one as last? Because we are just run out of time. Okay. Uh, a crucial aspect was economic class because the change, the social change, uh, it was in family, it was in home, and this is it, it was a discovery of the social workers, and that's why Elena Torres Cuella play a significant role in this history because they she improved the missionary um, the it, I, itinerant missionary uh, because they she uh, include a social worker and a basic aspect was uh, the economic class because they had to change the family they had to change the family organization in order to achieve the SEPS go goals. So I'm sorry, I would like to say in better words this, <laughs> uh, this uh, process, but this is my mm. English. No, so, thank you so much, Marco. Uh, as I was saying at, at the beginning, we are all struggling, but we also want to be heard in different countries or, or parts of the world. So we're embracing this struggle and, and thank you so much for it. Thank you again, 
uh, Marco and Carlos for being here, for sharing with us your ideas and your comments about rural education and social experiments. Thank you again, everyone else who was here, and I hope to see you soon in other ELAS events. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you. I um, just want to remind everyone that this book presentation will be uploaded to ELAS YouTube. And within the next couple of weeks, we hope you enjoy this talk and please stay tuned for our activities next academic year. Have a great end to the semester and until next time.